my sight and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. And now I am happy all the day. Thus. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. my sight and now I am happy all day. let's sing verse 5 I, I forgot what verse we were on I was trying to figure out that's what it was and I couldn't pick it up out there let's sing verse 5 but drops okay but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe here Lord I give myself away is all that I can do at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. I feel better. Thank you. Go ahead, brother. Uh, dear Heavenly Father God, thank you uh, uh, for this day. Thank you for the rain. Uh, Lord, I just ask that you move our hearts in a way uh, for us to live in gratitude uh, each and every day, Lord, uh, to you. Uh, and even in the small matters of the large, Lord, uh, I pray that we walk this earth in thankfulness to you uh, with our hearts full of joy, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Hymn number 238, Beneath the Cross of Jesus. We're going to sing some cross songs tonight. cross of Jesus I fain would take my stand the shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land a home within the wilderness a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day upon that cross of jesus mine eye at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me and from my smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess the wonders of his glorious love and my unworthiness. I take, O oh, cross my shadow for my abiding place. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face content to let the world go by to know no gain or loss my sinful self my only shame my glory all the cross amen good 
scene. Okay, now uh, 252, down at the cross. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. 285, I will sing of my Redeemer. <laughs> 285. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate is saved. In his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will praise my dear Redeemer. His triumphant power I'll tell. How the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. 
On the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. Oh, it's you tonight. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Those of you who can hear me, you can open your Bibles to 2 Samuel, there it is, 2 Samuel 19. We got through all of chapter 18 last week. If you'll open to 2 Samuel 19, isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord tonight? I was just thinking of that this, today. You know, I just graduated on Saturday. I have more time on my hands, and I don't know how you retirees do it, because I was sitting there about Monday thinking, man, I wish it was church again, because it was just a slow week for me. Anyway. 2 Samuel 19, if you remember, we're at the tail end of a long campaign in which Absalom is trying to overthrow David as king, and now it's coming to its conclusion as Absalom has died. And uh, some would say, if you think about this situation, where Absalom has been perhaps the worst son you could possibly be. He's blatantly trying to take the kingdom from David. He lays with David's concubines. He um, sets forth several battles against David and his men. Probably the absolute worst son that you could be. And yet Absalom has died. And we see in the last chapter David mourning that death. David's grief over the death of his son. Some may say that the natural reaction to the death of somebody like this in your life would be relief. I mean, he's been on the run. He's been run out of Jerusalem. And yet He's grieving. David hears of his son's passing, and he has compassion and grief and mourning over his son. And that's going to bleed into the passage this week as well, as we begin in 2 Samuel chapter 19. Let's start in verse 1. It says, It was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourning for Absalom. So the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people. For the people heard that day, the king is grieving for his son. And the people stole into the city that day as people steal uh, in who are ashamed when they flee in battle. The king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Of course, we see this mourning that we saw in the last chapter. And I want you to take special notice and special care of the attitude that we see David's men taking upon. You would understand them being celebratory, as they were just verses ago. We saw the death of Absalom, their greatest adversary at this point, this guy who had been chasing them and battling them for chapters and chapters of the Bible, it seems. And now, as they see that their king is mourning, as they realize that their celebratory response is not the proper response, they mourn with the king too. That celebration is turnly, uh, quickly turned into taking on the emotions of their king. If he's going to mourn, we will also. So as they enter into the city, when it says that turn of a phrase, they stole into the city that day as people steal in who are ashamed when they flee into battle. It's kind of a, a different way of saying they entered the city as if they had lost the battle. That's the countenance that was upon them. Their heads are down. It's as if they had lost the battle. They're taking on the weeping of their king. What selflessness we see from these guys to be able to say, you know what, in my own heart, I would probably be celebrating. And in my own heart, I would be rejoicing that this great adversary is gone. And yet the selflessness that we see, that they take on the mourning of David upon themselves. It reminds me of a famous verse in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. There's bigger things on their plate than celebrating the death of Absalom. So the king has lost his son, therefore we must mourn. Verse 5, then Joab came into the house to the king and said, you have today covered with shame the faces of all your servants who have this day saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines. 
because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. For you have made it clear today that commanders and servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today, then you would be pleased. Now therefore arise, go out and speak kindly to your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you do not go, not a man will stay with you this night, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. Then the king arose and took his seat in the gate. And the people were all told, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. And all the people came before the king. Now we see in this passage, Joab speaks, I mean, frankly, very out of turn for the way that he ought to be speaking with the king. This is incredibly disobedient. He speaks not just informally to the king, and we see this in other places as well, where there's formal greetings that you're supposed to give to a king, and occasionally we see people greeting the king informally, but not only is he talking to him rather informally, but I would say disrespectfully. He's telling him that basically he's in the wrong for mourning here. You're shaming all of your servants, and you're, uh, you're shaming your sons and your daughters and your wives and your concubines. And he says, you hate those who hate, or you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. And it's such strong language. You have made it clear today that the commanders and your servants are nothing to you. He's presuming a lot of the motivations and emotions of David here. He speaks rather disrespectfully to the king. Needless to say, Joab doesn't see this morning as a very good thing. He says that from his perspective, David is shaming all of the soldiers who have fought for him. He's practically saying that David thinks nothing of these men and that if he was being true to himself and speaking out what he's feeling in his heart, that he would rather have Absalom alive than all of his soldiers put together. And that he says that all of your soldiers are likely to turn against you tonight, this very night, if you continue mourning in this manner. Such disrespect and I don't even know how to put it. He just completely warps David's emotions and intentions a father mourning for his son in Joab's eyes has turned into this shameful thing in front of all of Israel. And yet, we see David's response. Joab commands him, arise this night, or it'll be worse for you than any evil that has been upon you from your youth until now. And it says in verse 8, then the king arose, and he took his seat in the gate. And the people were all told, behold, the king is sitting in the gate. And all the people came before the king. Yet another act of selflessness that we see. We see the men being selfless in the previous verses where they would rather be celebratory and yet they're going to lay that aside and mourn with their king. And now David takes on this same selfless nature. David wants to mourn and rightfully so. His son is dead. But for the sake of unity, for the sake of his people, for the sake of returning the kingdom back to normality, he puts on a good face, and he sits out at the gate, and he allows the people to come before him. It's passages like this, I mean, in addition to all the battle passages where thousands of people have died and all these hard decisions that David has to make, it's little things like this that make me glad that I don't have to be the king. In a situation where he would be mourning for his son and needs time to do so, he has to put on a good face. For the sake of the normality of his people, the men are weary. I'm sure when they were ready to return home, they were ready to see their families, they were ready to turn back to normal after a long campaign. And David swallows his emotions and allows them to do that. I love this mutual selflessness that we see on the part of David and his men. The men see that David is mourning, so they mourn. And David sees that they don't need this mourning at this time. They need something else, a return to normal, and he provides that for them as well. The only one who really isn't selfless in this passage is Joab, who has really disrespectfully talked to David, but that's neither here nor there. We see a lot of selflessness in this passage that I really appreciate. And now starting in the back half of verse 8 and on through 15. Now Israel had fled every man to his own home, and all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, 
The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, whom we appointed, who we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house? When the word of all Israel has come to the king, you are my brothers, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God, do so to me and more also, if you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, return both you and all your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring him, or and to bring the king over the Jordan. What an interesting part of this passage that we see, that we see this division and argument among the tribes, that some of the tribes have accepted David back as their king, and rightfully so. You look back at the passage, and it says, this is the king who has saved us from the Philistines. All of Israel has turned their back on David. Universally, every tribe, all of Israel had accepted Absalom as their new king. And now that he's dead, the big question mark over the whole situation is, who, who do we take? Who is the next king? And the obvious answer is David, because David was their rightful king in the first place. He is the anointed one. He is the one that the passage remind us saved us from the hands of the Philistines. David is the greatest king throughout Israel's history. This is the obvious answer. And yet we see Judah dragging their feet. David's own tribe, no less, dragging their feet on accepting David back as their king. What another stab in the gut that David must be feeling right now, that for one, his son had died. And this is after a long line of tragedy in David's life. And now, as he's still mourning for his son, though he has to put on a good face for his people, his own tribe is saying, I don't know if you should be our king anymore. This, for me, marks the seedbed of the divided monarchy that we have defining much of the rest of the Old Testament. I mean, you read throughout the books of Kings and the books of Chronicles, and all you see is division. The kingdom of Israel and their kings, and the kingdom of Judah and their kings. Even under Absalom, who by most definitions is a horrible king, even under Absalom, at least they were united. At least they were together. At least they were all one nation. But now we're seeing the seedbed of this division and schisming that's going to define Israel and Judah for the rest of their history. Judah is dragging their feet. And this is where we see these subtle cracks of disunity enter into the kingdom. And once the kingdom is divided, this is just going to bring worse and worse things, right? We see that along with their division comes idolatry and waywardness from God and all of these kings turning toward building Asherah poles and selling the gold from the temple to surrounding nations and worshiping all of these other gods. And we see even the most brutal things that you can imagine Israel turning toward, like sacrificing children to Molech, all of this during the time of division. And this, in my opinion, is where we first see that begin. This is the seedbed of the divided monarchy. Judah here is being rebellious. They're being disobedient. They have forgotten that David is their rightful king. David is the king who God has anointed. And it reminds me of a passage from earlier. This is Samuel speaking, and this is 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23. Now, just to remind you of the context of this passage, he's speaking over Saul, and he's saying, Saul, this is the reason that the Lord is taking his hand off of you. Because Saul has just 
sacrificed in a manner that only the priests are allowed to sacrifice. And this is what he says. 1 Samuel 15, beginning in verse 22. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And this is what I really want to focus on. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination as, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected you from being king. Powerful words from Samuel, where he says, rebellion is as bad as divination. And divination is a horrible sin for which we see passages in the Torah where we see people practicing divination and the punishment is to stone that person to death. The entire community takes part in killing this person to remind the entire Israelite community, this is what we do to people who, who stray from the way of the Lord. And yet Samuel says rebellion against the word of the Lord is as bad as divination. And insubordination, an unwillingness to be obedient is as bad as idolatry. Idolatry that's going to define the rest of Israel's history. And this disobedience is as bad as idolatry. He says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, Saul, he has also rejected you from being king. Now in this passage, of course, Judah isn't directly disobeying the direct words of the Lord here. The Lord has not come down and said, Judah, take David back as your king. And yet, David is the Lord's anointed, anointed by the Lord himself. Samuel calls this sin rebellion. And he says it's as bad as divination and idolatry. And yet we see the reaction from David. I think back to the reaction that he has of his child dying, Absalom. And I had said earlier, the natural reaction that some of us might have had at such a rebellious child... And a child who is literally trying to murder David, the reaction a lot of us might have had at his death would be relief. And yet David reacts with compassion. And here David responds not with anger or with the disciplined hand that we think he might ought to or that we would in this situation. He instead reacts with the outstretched arm. He sends Abiathar and Zadok, priests, to minister to Judah it is the priests who are in charge of sacrificing on behalf of the people, obviously, and for taking care of so many needs of the people. They would have seen this as an olive branch, that he's sending priests to us to appeal to us. And he appeals to Amasa. Amasa is his nephew who previously had rebelled against David. But the key is that Amasa is from the tribe of Judah. He's appealing to them, saying that he will appoint Amasa into this key role back into his regime. And Judah responds with, yes, we will obey you. Thus we see in verse 15 that while Judah was hesitant in accepting David back as their king, he is, this tribe is the first one to welcome him back into the city. Again in verse 15, so the king came back to the Jordan and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over to the Jordan. What an excellent job of repairing and bringing back a sinful and wayward tribe that David has done. We're going to end here, but it reminds me of Galatians chapter 6. You can go ahead and flip to Galatians, because I'm going to read quite a bit of it. Galatians, we're going to begin at the tail end of, verse, or of chapter 5. And this chapter, or this passage that we're about to read is a beautiful picture of what it ought to look like to restore a brother in the way that David has done right now, to restore, to restore this tribe of Judah. Beginning in verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. This is chapter 5, by the way, Galatians 5, verse 20. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, Strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not 
inherit the kingdom of God. And I just want to pause there. As you read over those sins, how many of those have we seen in the books of Samuel? Division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, dissensions, rivalries, so many of these things. And yet we read on the fruit of the Spirit. And it's interesting because we have the Spirit living inside of us, and these are the things that ought to pour out from our own lives now that we have the Spirit within us. But David has the Spirit on him as well. He's not just anointed with oil, he's anointed by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. We see these attitudes of love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We see these exhibited amazingly through David in restoring the kingdom together. A kingdom that has denied him as their king and a kingdom that is going to continue to deny him as he reaches out to Judah. And we look on at what Paul says we ought to do in restoring one who is disobedient, rebellious, as Judah is in this passage. Chapter 6, verse 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. What a powerful example we see from David in this passage, both of selflessness as he has laid aside his own emotions to say, I'm going to put on a strong demeanor. I'm going to put on a good face for my people. And now he reaches out to the tribe of Judah in gentleness, in patience, in peace, at his own flesh and bone that he says twice in the passage, his own flesh and bone, who have denied him and are hesitating on accepting him back as the king, and yet he restores them. He reaches out to them with gentleness and spirituality, that Paul tells us to have when we restore a brother. What a wonderful example we have from David in this passage. And that is all I have. Does anyone have anything they want to add to 2 Samuel chapter 19, the beginning of the chapter? The second half is pretty exciting too. If not, we can go on to prayer requests. All righty, thank you guys. Good evening, everybody. Everybody awake? Nobody is awake, Andy. You put them all to sleep, brother. You did well, my friend. Thank you. It is a sad day to be a Southern Baptist. Everybody agree? It's a sad day to be a Southern Baptist today. I am, I am very upset about what has come out this week. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, you will know that uh, last year at the um, at the annual convention, that the, the annual meeting that uh, Brother Dave and I were at, uh, we we all voted that we would do a uh, an independent uh, study on all of these sexual abuse cases, and they came out with that report on Sunday that said that we had in fact had a list of over 700 offenders that we chose to do nothing with. It was a bad day to be a Southern Baptist. So I want you to know that, that uh, from, from our standpoint at Temple Baptist Church, you know, we, do not, we do not tolerate that at all. Uh, we have uh, stuff in place. We have background checks. We have policies that we are creating to make sure that nothing like this would ever happen here. Um, I, I, am, I am happy to say that they are about to release the names of the 700 uh, men that are on the list. That we, they will be uh, releasing that hopefully this week, uh, next week, late next week, or early next week at the latest. They'll be releasing that. As of current, 
of those 706 people on the list, only two, I say only, that's two too many, but only two are still in active ministry at a Southern Baptist church. But there are two still in active ministry. There are tons of reports. Uh, there's a 288-page document that uh, is out from guideposts that all the things that they found, five terabytes worth of data. If you know anything about data, that is a, a lot of data. So five terabytes of data that they came up with. Um, and so 288-page report. If you haven't read it or don't know where to find it, text me and I'll send it to you if you're interested in it. Um, so I'll tell you that, that, that it is, it's terrible. It is absolutely terrible. Um, our, our president of the executive committee last year was Ronnie Floyd. He's been president for uh, several years. He, uh, one of the direct questions to him was, is there a list? And I don't know if you remember this, but I remember it very plainly. He said, I am not aware of any list. And uh, he is no longer our president. He stepped down for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, he, he lied to every single person in that room and there were thousands and thousands of people in that room. Um, so I am, I, am, I am very concerned about where we have been as a Southern Baptist Convention. I'm, I'm a little concerned about where we're going, although I, I, think, I think and pray that the steps that we are taking now are, are going to be um, sufficient, but we can never make up for the 20 years that we have literally just been um, sweeping it under the rug and, and uh, minimizing uh, the sexual assaults that our pastors have been doing to our parishioners. And so it just cannot be, cannot, should not be tolerated at any level. And it will not be tolerated here at, at Temple Baptist Church. But I, I hope that as you guys, um, you know, we won't always be at Temple Baptist Church forever. I'm, I'm sure that some will move on. I, I hope that, that you are cognizant of, of what has gone on and, and steps to protect your family as well. As we, we take it very seriously here and we are taking your kids' safety um, our, as our utmost importance. And we'll be making more changes uh, to come in order that, that we may be held accountable as a staff, that we may be held accountable as a, as a church. Um, but I, I want you guys to know that, that we are, we have done many things. We will continue to do many things in order that this prayerfully will not be a problem here at Temple Baptist Church. But if it is, it will be dealt with immediately, all right? It will not be swept under the rug um, at all. So questions, how many of you guys have read Part of the 288-page report, anyway. How I many of you guys knew about the 288-page report? Okay, good. So uh, again, it came out Sunday. Today they came out that they were going, they're about to release the 700 names. Um, and so, for far too long, they've been sweeping it under the rug. And say so they're they're going to release all 706 names um, that are on that report. Now, those are 706 names that are accredited. That they they have they have actual real data that they have been or have done sexual predator uh, to uh, an underage uh, person or to um, uh, sexually assaulted a um, raped uh, an older female. Um, and so all of these are actual names that, that are uh, accredited. So that's one of my biggest things and one of my biggest concerns, I've talked to my wife about, is we don't want the pendulum to switch so far the other side that anybody can say anything and we're out of ministry forever, you know what I mean? And so I don't want to, that's my concern, is that we, we over swing the pendulum back the other way. Um, but we definitely need to do something to protect our, our children and our, our youth, so, which is primarily um, the people on the list, by the way. Questions? Oh, no. Yes, I know. Why, why would they say we had sexual assault in a Baptist convention? Because we do. Yeah, it's very bad, isn't it? It's terrible. Okay, any other, any other questions, any other comments, any other? 
I didn't want to ignore it. Can't ignore it. Shouldn't ignore it. Uh, I don't know what else we'll do. But, all right. Let's move on to our prayer time. Please be praying for Gerald Miller. Uh, I sent that out last night. Uh, that's uh, Sister Barbara McLean's dad. He's in a hospital in Nebraska. Uh, he is he is uh, pretty imminent. If he doesn't uh, pass before uh, before tomorrow morning, they'll they'll meet with the family and talk about a hospice uh, for him. Uh, but obviously, he's pretty imminent, and he has. Uh, she's been able to to witness to him on a couple of occasions since she's been there this time. He has a couple of of times where he's. He's very coherent, and uh, so we're praying for more of those moments. All right, so th that's what we want to pray for as a as a church family. Is we want to pray for for more uh, times of clarity that she is able to share um, the good news of Jesus with him. And so, uh, be praying for that. He's not uh, in any pain right now. They they have him on a lot of morphine, um, so he's not in a lot of pain. Uh, so that's 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 a good thing. But be praying for. For moments of clarity that she can uh, witness to him. Be praying for Brother Don, outpatient procedure coming up on the 8th. Sister uh, Cheryl Jackson has her heart ablation coming up on the 6th. Uh, Brother Mike Craig, he's going to have back surgery on the 2nd. So that is, uh, remember, they're going to uh, put in a couple of rods and they're going to fuse a couple of vertebrae and he's got to stay two nights or so in the hospital. So um, Brother Andy will actually be uh, preaching for him over in Tecumseh on the 5th. So that'd be good. So be praying for, for Brother Mike. Uh, Steve Jackson, he had surgery uh, on Monday. Back surgery went really well, really well. He They came home today, this afternoon, they came home. Uh, so they are home, but he's in pain, obviously. But other than that, everything looks looks good. They also took out his uh, stimulator at the same time. So I don't, you guys have known Steve for quite a while. He's He's got that back stimulator. They took it out because he, he just didn't feel like it was really working anymore for him. Uh, and prayerfully, he won't need it anymore. So, yeah. So, prayerfully, these are all these are all good things. Sister Amanda Cole will be praying for her as well. Uh, we moved Abigail Mace from the back to the front, so she's on family needs, the, the Mace family in general, under A there. Um, she has officially uh, gone. Uh, she's She crossed over into to California this morning. So, uh, I, I don't, were they actually going to arrive today? Or? Okay. Awesome. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a long drive, for sure. So, be praying for them as they finish their travel. Um, I don't know how long that is. It's about five hours to the border, but I don't know how far they are from... Okay. Okay. So you're mapping it? Yeah, awesome. It's about five and a half hours. So uh, be praying for them as they try to finish their the last leg of their trip. And again, should be gone uh, right now, planning on summer, but um, probably the next semester as well. So just be praying for them. Uh, be praying for, for her family, her mom, her dad, and her grandma as well. And then, uh, all right, so nursing homes, Brother Don Moore, he is still in Regency. He's doing okay, not not great, but not, not terrible either, so that's good. I uh, heard from Frank this week. They are absolutely loving it. They're loving where they're at. They're really enjoying uh, being there. They're kicking themselves for not having done it sooner, so that's a blessing for sure. Uh, Frank and Sandra Migo. I think that's all I got on the front page. Anybody got anything on the front page they want to add to or give me any updates on? All right, you guys are being easy tonight. Missions and churches, Brazil mission trip. So July 18th through the 28th, be praying for that. We do have a meeting on that this evening after service. Um, be praying for the rest home ministry. That That is something huge. That's, that is an amazing ministry uh, that Brother Tommy uh, heads up and, and steers, and that is a, a, an excellent ministry for him and uh, for our church. So be praying for that. Uh, also, our kids camp that comes next week. Uh, 
already here. So be praying for our volunteers, probably more so than the kids. Um, but be praying for the kids as well, and be praying that uh, that if they are not saved, that this they, they would be uh, really hit with the gospel while they are away on this uh, camp. So keep praying for them. Um, and then uh, the the next week is our our youth camp as well. So be praying for that. VBS is coming at the end of June. We do still need some volunteers for that. So if you guys are game for some VBS stuff, game, because it's, you know, never mind, never mind. If you know what the theme is this year, you would have got the joke, but that's all good. Moving on. What is the theme? Sports. Victory. Sports. Pep rally. Cheerleading. Sports. Do you guys know what we're going to have on the stage yet? Still kicking it around? <laughs> I could keep going. I could keep, I could be here all night. What? Nice. Could we take all these pews out in the front here and just like start kicking off? No? No? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Very good. Are you a flat football. Thank you, Ronald. Put you down for that one flat football. Got that. Got you on that. Um, so if you didn't hear, uh, Janice, she is uh, sister Bethany is going to be asking for some pictures of maybe some sports equipment that you have that we could borrow, uh, so be ready for that. Uh, but Kathy uh, Cargill, Kathy Cargill, is Larry still here? Or is he heading out? He was here, but he, he, he headed out. But uh, Sister Kathy is, is healing well. Um, yeah. He is on a time, he is very much on a time limit. Yes, he is. Uh, with, between Kathy Down and, and Sister Wanda getting worse, absolutely. That's one we need to add to our our prayer list is Wanda. Um, she's, she is getting much worse, so we need to be praying for for uh, Kathy and Larry and, and Sister Wanda as well. So uh, we will add we will add them to our list. Carol Fuller's friend uh, uh, having heart tests. This was actually just placed on the on the uh, on the podium here, so I'm, I'm not I don't have any updates or any any news on this one. Does anybody have anything? Know anything on this one? Uh, be praying for AJ and Don, his son, Mateo. Remember, he's uh, traveling to Kenya and Uganda and um, all of those wonderful things. you will also be traveling to Louisiana starting tomorrow morning, right? So be praying for them. And then uh, Sister, he's already there. Okay, wonderful. And then Sister Dawn had an injection in her uh, knee uh, today. Going well? Good. Very good. All right. Uh, little Mackenzie. So she doesn't get to go in until August. What? August 15th. That's crazy. We'll pray for a cancellation. Are you on the cancellation list? All right. <laughs> All right. Well, we will be praying, sister. Let me see if I have any updates instead of going down to each one of these. Brother Glenn still uh, still trying to figure out what they're going to do with his pinched nerves. They're not they're not sure how they're going to how they're actually going to go about fixing that. At least that was the update I had yesterday. Anybody have any other updates from Glenn? Noah, they told us uh, today that we should come home next week, Wednesday. So a week from today, we should be able to come home and actually start doing the home dialysis at home. So that will be that will be a blessing because it's 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 grueling, it's time consuming, and we are ready to be home. 
Brother Vince, did you get your lab work done, brother? Did you get your lab work done? Not yet. It could be your conscience. No, don't be your conscience. <laughs> yeah, right? Let's, let's just text Vince every day. Have you done your lab work yet? I am looking, and I don't believe I have any other updates. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't. I don't have a good a update for them at all. I don't. I have been slacking in that area. I do know that they're allowing us back into Shawnee Care Center finally, so I will. I will make that a priority and go visit them. And if I can pull Sister Sandra out from Bingo, I'll talk to her too. <laughs> you probably know about Sister Sandra. She, how's she doing? Fine. She go on Sunday. There you go. Did you see Don? Don Moore. Wow. Wow. Don? Yes, he sure is. Right. Yes, I saw that briefly. Uh, that was yesterday, right? Yeah, I, 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 I honestly don't haven't read the news hardly at all lately. I just, I just, I was actually at another doctor appointment with Noah yesterday afternoon and just saw it on one of their screens. So it was a school shooting. Is that right? Goodness, that's crazy. time in prayer. We've got, uh, oh, we got time for two of us, I think. Yeah. Doing all right? What about, uh, what about Brother AJ? Yeah. I'll take one of Don's. Since he's closer. Uh, Don. Yeah. We'll let Don go and then uh, Brother AJ, and then I'll close this ever so quickly. He should be going home. Uh, he's got another week left, I think. Yeah. Okay. Even going to cover it? Yeah. So insurance covers for another week. So that's we're hoping to get him out by then. Yeah. Yes. So soon, very soon. Brother Don, thank you. Father God, we truly thank and praise you just for the privilege of being in your presence tonight, dear Lord. And Father, for the um, many requests that have been presented to us. Father, I just come before you with the excitement of the upcoming events of um, children's camp and youth camp a week after that. And Father, just on the heels behind all that, VBS, dear Lord, um, you're doing such exciting work in the young lives, dear Lord. I would just pray that you be with the adults that are going and the kids and the Father, that their hearts and minds would be open to, to the words that you have for them to hear. And, Father, for um, the needed workers yet for VBS, Father, I just pray that you get people excited about that. Dear Lord, you know the exciting time we had last year and just the kids that are excited about coming back. And, dear Lord, I just pray that you help each of us to be a vessel, your hands and feet, for those that you bring in. And, Father, for the many, many, many medical needs, dear Lord, that are before us, dear Lord, those that are 
upcoming for surgeries, those that are waiting appointments, Father, those that are recovering. Father, we thank and praise you just um, for Steve Jackson, just for how well the surgery went. Um, I just pray for his continued healing. And, Father, that you would provide him some relief from the pain. And, Father, we would pray that for Glenn Peck, Lord. I just pray that they would somehow figure out how to to bring him some relief dear lord that um, he would see some subsiding to this pain and dear lord um, as we think about pain dear lord we can't imagine the suffering that these families are going through in texas dear lord father i just pray that you would raise up a body of believers to rally around these families in the community dear lord just to be your hands and feet as we prayed and father that they can show the love of Jesus in such a tragic time when we can't even begin to make sense of it. Father, again, I just thank you for um, allowing us to come to your presence. Father, to lay these requests at your feet. And Father, even for those that are not, haven't been spoken to much, Lord, we just ask that you would intercede for them. And Father, I do um, finally want to lift up. Father, those that still need to hear your word. Father, those that um, have heard and heard and heard and time again, dear Lord, that you would finally open their ears and their hearts to hear your word. Or just the, whether the, it be here in America or across the seas, dear Lord, I just pray that you'd be with those people who are sharing. And Father, that your will would be done in this situation.
hope that uh, you have a good week. I hope you come back on Sunday. It's going to be a, a good Lord's Day on Sunday. So.